Developing right now on Morning News Now, a series of strong overnight earthquakes in the Sea of Japan. They rattled the country's western coast. Tsunami warnings have been issued by local officials who are urging people to leave and get to higher ground. Well, much more on that in just a moment. In the Middle East this morning, a major escalation in the violence involving U.S. forces with the Navy now saying it's retaliated against Iranian-backed attackers from Yemen in the Red Sea. What this means for the already tense region. And back home, we've got our eye on that holiday travel rush as it's finally coming to a close on this New Year's Day. In just a moment, our Michelle Grossman has our full back to reality forecast as we start off the first week of 2024. Plus, it's out with the old, in with the new this morning. Later this hour, we're crossing the country with a look at how America welcomed in the new year. And good morning and happy new year. I'm Stephen Romo in for Joe and Savannah today. And we start this hour with that developing story out of Japan, where a series of earthquakes in the Red Sea, in the Sea of Japan, rather, have shaken the central part of the country. It's caused widespread damage and triggered a tsunami warning along its west coast. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now with the latest on this. Megan, good morning to you. So what can you tell us about these quakes and the damage that they may have caused? Stephen, good morning. First, uh, Japanese officials have just downgraded from a major tsunami warning to a tsunami warning for the region near the epicenter. Now, preliminary reports are that a 7.6 magnitude earthquake hit off the central west coast of Japan near the Ishikawa province, which is about 140 miles east of Tokyo. Uh, this earthquake was felt on land across the region, even as far as Tokyo. We are seeing video coming in, capturing the moments that this quake hit. You can see waves coming on land, uh, large signs inside a train station shaking, people running for safety, store shelves rattling. We also know that homes have collapsed. Others have been damaged. Local officials confirm that people have been injured by fallen debris and have been taken to the hospitals. At least six people so far reportedly trapped beneath fallen rubble inside homes. Uh, now, while we did mention, of course, that we have seen a downgrade in the severity of the tsunami warning, meteorologists have measured the highest wave so far at around four feet high and they say that they could see waves exceeding 16 feet Stephen. wow that is concerning indeed along with those collapsed homes you mentioned we know that more than 31,000 are without power and that is yeah. as temperatures drop into the 30s what are officials doing to help the residents Right. So officials have already started setting up shelters in the area. Uh, we know of two that have gone up so far with warm blankets and supplies for those who are in need. At this point, though, uh, there's still no way to tell just how full those shelters will get and how quickly they could fill up, Stephen. And anytime there's a tsunami warning, I can't help but think of the Fukushima disaster back in 2011, yeah. where that tsunami caused a nuclear meltdown. Do we have any updates about the nuclear facilities in that area? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And right now, government officials say that nuclear plants in the area have not seen any irregularities, but uh, you can bet that they will absolutely be paying close attention to those. And this area seeing an uptick overall in seismic activity, what is the level of concern about more quakes that could be on the way? Yeah, you know, I mean, look, there's there's a lot of concerns here for aftershocks, not only for today, but over the coming days as well. Uh, and you can bet that they will be monitoring monitoring those uh, nuclear plants closely, because as you mentioned, 2011, a 9.0 magnitude quake off the coast of northeastern Japan. Uh, it caused this tsunami, resulting in a massive wave crashing into the Fukushima nuclear plant. That then knocked out power to a cooling system. A hydrogen explosion occurred the next day, which then resulted resulted uh, in radiation going into the air. So it's important, of course, to reiterate that this point, uh, at this point, nuclear plants in the Ishikawa province have not seen irregularities, but officials are keenly aware of just how serious this situation is uh, on many fronts, Stephen. Yeah, serious indeed. All right, Megan Fitzgerald, thanks for that update. And now to our other big story this morning. Millions of Americans making their way back home after the holidays. AAA says more than 150 million people traveled more than 50 miles from home over the 10-day period between Christmas and the New Year. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton is at LaGuardia Airport in New York City with more on this. Good morning to you, Antonia. So what's it like out there right now? Hey, Stephen. Happy New Year. 
it is pretty relaxed right now. People are making their way to counters and through security very smoothly here at LaGuardia. We're not seeing the long lines yet that we saw heading into Christmas and that some people anticipate may happen here in New York and elsewhere uh, in the coming hours or throughout even maybe tomorrow as people still make their way out of their celebrations um, and back into their regular routines. As you mentioned, AAA has estimated that not only that there's 115 million travelers leaving of 50 miles or so from home, but also that this is the second busiest year end travel year in more than 20 years since 2000 when they first started tracking all of this. And at times over the last several days, travel records have reached near or even exceeded near pre-pandemic levels. And so we had seen these long lines, at times delays in airports. There are very few delays, although some of them here in the New York area, out of Miami, places like Denver. And so, you know, certainly, although it's pretty calm right now, if you have a flight today, play it smart, try to get to the airport early, and, you know, expect some kinds of disruptions. That's always possible on the first couple days of the year, Stephen. So airports not looking too bad. Do we know uh, other forms of travel, trains, uh, Amtrak, were they having delays? Yes. So yesterday, Amtrak was a little bit of a mess in the Northeast. According to officials there, there was a server problem that caused hours-long delays. But they say that that's now been resolved and trains were up and running back on their regular schedules as of the uh, afternoon and evening last night. So the hope is today things get off without a hitch. But the same sort of advice applies even if you're taking Amtrak buses or driving and hitting the roads very soon. You want to try to leave ideally in some of the early morning hours or after 7 p.m. You know, it's those uh, periods when people are commuting, even on a day like today, many people are still working, and those sort of middle of the day, sort of lunchtime periods that can be challenging. So try to leave early in the morning or try to leave in the evening after everyone else has made their way home. Yeah, good advice there. Do we know anything about uh, what travelers can do themselves to try to make things go more smoothly? It is a holiday, so some people might be caught off guard. That's right. I mean, we say this every single year at this time of the year that the best thing you can do is arrive early, especially if you have to check a bag. We have seen that some airports, places like Atlanta, where some of our colleagues were just the other day, there are some long lines at times just to do something simple like check your bag and start walking toward your gate. And so adding in maybe at least an extra hour of time, more than you think you might need to get where you need to go, that can make all the difference here. But also to have a backup plan so that if something goes wrong and you have a place you need to be to know what your other route, what the driving route might look like for you to get to your destination, you know, especially if you're traveling with kids and you're in a group, in your family, have a backup plan, have food, know where you're going to stop and get rest and snacks along the way. All of those things make a busy period where we know that on the roads and in the skies, things can be delayed up to 20% or so. Have a plan and get where you're trying to go early, Stephen. That is such a good point, especially about food. You cannot go wrong with snacks. They always make the situation better, not worse. And Tony, thanks so much for That's that. That's right. All right, now let's get a check of your morning news now forecast for those travel plans with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Stephen. Great to see you. Happy New Year. And we are looking really, really quiet on this New Year. Travel-wise, weather-wise, it's going to be good. Uh, tomorrow kind of ramps up a little bit, and then as we get towards midweek, we're going to be much busier. But this is what today looks like. Lots of sunshine across the nation from the northwest to the southwest, the south central states, lots of sunshine as well. The northern plains, we're going to be above normal in terms of temperatures with lots of sunshine. The upper Midwest looking good as well. Could see a few showers along the Gulf Coast. We have a uh, front that's sort of draped over the area. It's going to pull off moisture from the Gulf and it's going to see we're going to see some thunderstorms as well. So that's right along the central Gulf. And then as we head towards portions of the Great Lakes, the Ohio Valley, we're seeing some snow. We're seeing snow also in the Appalachians. That's where we're going to see the highest amount before it kind of winds down tomorrow in the Appalachians. We could see one, two, three inches of snow. And then it's going to move off to the east and we're going to see some rain showers into the mid-Atlantic, not amounting to much but still, you're going to need the windshield wipers as you're out and about. New England looking good. We're looking at temperatures chilly right around the freezing mark, but we're looking
looking at sunshine. And then it translates to a really nice travel map weather-wise. We're looking at green all across the board here. That's what's expected for today. With the exception of the Appalachians, we're going to see some tricky roads, some slick roads with the snow in place. And that's mainly in the highest mountains of Virginia and also West Virginia. But Chicago looking good. Dallas looking good. The major hubs along the East Coast, Boston, New York City, D.C. looking really good as well. Things start to change. Not on the East Coast tomorrow. Still looking good. Still looking good in Chicago if you're traveling on any of these roadways. But the South Central states, we're going to see rain working into portions of Texas and the parts of Louisiana as well. That's going to slow you down in Houston. And then on the West Coast, we have another storm system that's moving on shore. We just keep seeing storm system after storm system moving on shore. We're going to see another one tomorrow. So Seattle, San Francisco, San Francisco we could slow it down on in the air. Also on the roadways along I-5 with heavy rain and also some wind. And then as we look at satellite radar, really quiet this morning. So if you're out and about, we're just looking at a little showers off the coast of the southwest of California. We're looking at those showers that I mentioned in parts of the Gulf. You can see that heavy rain where you see those darker colors, but not a whole lot. Then we're looking at blue in portions of the Ohio Valley, also the Appalachians. That's where we're seeing the heaviest snow falling, and we'll see some rain into the Mid-Atlantic. It's a clipper-like system, so it doesn't have a whole lot of moisture. It's moving relatively quickly, and it's going to continue to do that. But notice this blue right here. That's going to stay in place not only today, but also tomorrow. That's why we might see one, two, three inches of snow in some spots. It clears out tomorrow, especially by the afternoon. We're left over with some breezy conditions, and it's going to be chilly, too, chillier than where we have been. The highest amounts of snow is in the darker blue, so we're looking at those mountains of West Virginia. Virginia, Virginia, where we could see locally up to four inches of snow. Then as we near Wednesday, we're, being, we're a little bit busier, but still not too bad. Gulf Coast rain, some could be heavy. Right along the Gulf, we have some light snow, once again, into the Great Lakes, interior portions of the Northeast. And then another strong storm moves on shore in the West. We're looking at uh, high elevation snow into the Intermountain West as well. Also some rain from the Pacific Northwest all the way down to Southern California. And Friday is going to be a wet day for many of us, staying really active in the West, into the Intermountain West really heavy rain once again, heavy snow in the highest elevations, and then look towards the upper Midwest, the upper Great Lakes, into the south central states. We're looking at rain and snow, a lot of rain along the Gulf Coast, and that's going to kind of creep into the lower Mississippi Valley. Really seasonal on the East Coast. We could see some Great Lakes snow, but we're going to be dry on Friday in the East Coast. And then we have this temperature divide, really warm in the Northern Plains, 17 degrees above normal, which is weird because it's 39. You feel like it should say 70 at that point, <laughs> yeah. so, but that's warm for that area and then cooler in the south central states. I bet they'll take it. Although I did hear that people ice fishing in that area, they do not like oh, this. Right. They want that ice. Yeah, so. because they want their every month of the winter. That's yeah. true. Somebody's always disappointed with yeah. something. Michelle Grossman, <laughs> thanks so much. Sure. All right, turning now to that major escalation we're seeing in the Middle East. That's where the U.S. Navy says it retaliated against attackers from Yemen in the Red Sea after they fired on Navy helicopters. The U.S. Defense Department says the choppers sank three of four boats operated, operated by Iranian-backed Houthi rebels out of Yemen that killed all the crew members on board. For more on this, we're joined by NBC News correspondent Jay Gray in Tel Aviv with yeah. more on this. Jay, this is the first lethal action the U.S. military has taken in those waters since the Israel-Hamas war started. What can you tell us about how that went down and what are we hearing from both sides? Yeah, and Stephen, this all started with a distress call from a container ship in the Red Sea. The U.S. Navy choppers responding to that SOS call when they say they were fired on by the iran bak Houthi rebels and returned that fire, sinking three of the, their ships, as you said, and killing uh, all of the personnel on board those ships. Uh, Navy officials are saying uh, that this is certainly uh, something they weren't looking for, that this was an attack that was brought on uh, them as they reached out to help this container ship that was working its way through. Uh, it's got to be a flashpoint in everything that's going on. You know, the U.S. troops have uh, seen back and forth skirmishes really escalate over the last month or so, uh, not only in the Red Sea, but in Lebanon and Syria as well. And so that's something they're definitely dealing with. The Houthis uh, on their part are saying they promise to retaliate against, and I'm quoting here, any country engaging in dangerous American behavior. So a lot of tension right now in that region. Hey, Jay, over the weekend, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told reporters the war is, quote, at its height and that it will go on for many more months, as we've heard also in recent weeks. Yeah. And this comes as he's facing more pressure for a ceasefire in Gaza. As we enter the new year, where do things stand for Israel's goal? They've said that they wanted to totally eliminate Hamas. 
Look, we've seen a, a real increase in fighting both on the ground and from airstrikes in the Hamunis area. And that's where the IDF believes a lot of the Hamas leaders are holed up, where they are, as they say, hiding. So they've really focused on that area. And you're right. Uh, globally, the pressure is mounting for some type of pause, some type of ceasefire. Uh, what Israel has said is that they've uh, destroyed a lot of Hamas's uh, command and control centers, uh, exposed a lot of the tunnels and areas where they have been uh, working underground, but haven't uh, at least told us or, or anyone that they've found a lot of the leaders. And so that's something they say they're going to continue to press on. And they've said repeatedly they are not going to back down. I would imagine that that's going to be a high topic of conversation with Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who's expected to be here in Tel Aviv sometime this week. Uh, meanwhile, the United Nations Agency for Palestinians uh, saying that there's at least 40 percent of the population in Gaza right now at risk of famine. And that's more than yeah. three quarters of a million people. Hard to, to fathom those numbers. Uh, grim situation there. But I understand we did hear some rare hopeful news on that front over the weekend. What was that? Yes, yeah, Stephen. Uh, Israel has said that they are prepared now to allow ships carrying aid to uh, come over and go to the Gaza border. There's been a military blockade uh, by Israel on Gaza since 2007. They've said that they will allow aid ships to come to the coast of Gaza and deliver food, water, medicine, things that are desperately needed. The hope is that with these ships, they can offload a, a lot more of those supplies. It's dispersing them into Gaza that may present a bit of a problem, but but they are, are very pleased with the idea that the Israeli Navy is going to allow these ships in. As, in fact, uh, Britain, France, Greece, the Netherlands all say that they are prepared right now uh, to send ships over and bring some of this aid. And the uh, director or Israel's foreign minister, rather, says uh, that this can begin immediately. So we're looking to see when those ships may make it to the shorelines of Gaza. Certainly much needed as we look at video of that dire situation. Yeah. Our Jay Gray reporting for us from Tel Aviv. Jay, thanks so much. We're just two weeks away now from the Iowa caucus, and former President Donald Trump is still holding a commanding lead in the Republican primary. Recent polling has Trump at 62 percent, followed by Ron DeSantis at just over 11 percent and Nikki Haley at 11 percent. Vivek Ramaswamy trails at 4 percent. The three candidates have faced the difficult task of trying to block Trump from the White House without alienating his supporters. And unless the courts uphold recent efforts to remove Trump from the primary ballots in some states, 2024 could look like a repeat matchup between Trump and President Biden. For more on this, let's bring in our 2024 political campaign embed, Sarah Dean. Sarah, good morning to you. So let's start with the ongoing effort to disqualify Trump from some state primary ballots. Has this had any impact on the way his campaign is operating ahead of the Iowa caucus? Good morning, Steve. Happy 2024, officially in the year of the election. As you mentioned, the Colorado Supreme Court and the Maine Secretary of State have both ruled Trump ineligible to be on their state primary ballots, and it's all due to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which says that uh, people that have taken an oath to the Constitution and then violated that by engaging in an insurrection, this time they're referring to January 6th, um, should be ineligible to hold office again. Um, as far as Trump's campaign, his campaign is appealing the decisions, but it hasn't affected it much so far as except to galvanize his supporters. Um, much like many of the indictments we've seen over the past year, um, his supporters have been galvanized and Donald Trump has been fundraising off of this, this these decisions um, attempting to parlay them as partisan decisions um, and an attack on him just to prevent him from becoming president um, again. And as far as the pace of his campaign, it's it's not slowing down, um, even though he's only had held about a fraction of the events that many of his counterparts have in Iowa. Um, over the next two weeks, either him himself, Donald Trump, or one of his campaign surrogates will be holding events almost every single day between now until January 15th in the Iowa caucus. So mm. so uh, they're not slowing down. No, not slowing down. It will be interesting to see this year how Trump can balance the court dates along with those campaign events. But I also wanted to ask about uh, Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ravaswamy. They've gone all in on Iowa. Are, what are they saying about this effort to get Trump off the ballot in some states? That would really help them if he was off the ballot. 
Yeah, they've certainly gone all in on Iowa. Both of them have completed what is known as the full Grassley, which is uh, named after Iowa Senator Chuck Grassley and is um, where they have visited all 99 counties in Iowa. Um, but both of them have actually condemned this decision. Like you said, it would help them if he was off the ballot, but they've condemned this decision. They've, uh, much like Donald Trump, have said that it is a partisan decision, that this should be in the hands of voters. And Vivek Ramaswamy has gone by far the farthest in the field. He has actually vowed to take himself off of any state primary ballot where Trump is barred. Um, he's actually called on the rest of the field to do so as well, but none of them have taken that pledge yet, Steve. But yes, he has vowed that if these decisions stand, he will take himself off those ballots. Hmm. It'll be interesting to see uh, less than two weeks away now, around two weeks until the Iowa caucus. Two weeks. All right, Sarah Dean, thanks so much. Well, it's been almost a year since Senator John Fetterman checked himself into Walter Reed National Medical Center to receive treatment for clinical depression. Meet the Press moderator Kristen Welker spoke to the senator about his recovery since that happened. Hello there, Stephen. This week on a special edition of Meet the Press on Mental Health, I spoke with Democratic Senator John Fetterman. Here's what he had to say about his battle with depression and his road to recovery. Were there ever moments when you were there seeking treatment when you started to lose hope? Yeah, every, every day is that end, end with why. You know, uh, you know, like a, you know, it's a, it's a depression joke. Uh, you know, and no, it's every day, every day I, I felt like there wasn't any hope uh, sometimes. And, and like, what do I have left? And. And feeling like there was no hope is what kind of drove me to that place. And, and that's why I want people to know that no matter how bad it might think or look right now, I, I'm begging you, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And e even if you think that's true, hold on. Just you got to hold on. And you can't imagine how much better it can get if you make the investment and the commitment to just hold that line and, and work to get better on that. You can see my full interviews and a lot more at meetthepress.com. You can also get more Meet the Press here on NBC News Now every weekday at 4 p.m. All right, Kristen Welker, we'll look for that. Thank you. And we've got much more to come this hour of Morning News Now, including a coast-to-coast -coast celebration that got America ringing in 2024 the right way. Plus, a welcome pay raise is in store this morning for minimum wage workers in half the country. But some business owners, well, they are already pushing back on this one. We've got the latest right after this. Welcome back. 2024 is officially here. Happy New Year. Coast to coast and around the whole world, people welcome in the new year in style. But what is more iconic than the ball drop in Times Square, where an estimated one million people gathered to celebrate the arrival of 2024? NBC News correspondent George Solis joins us now from Times Square. George, good morning. Happy New Year to you. First, I got to ask, did you get any rest last night? Hey, Stephen. Happy New Year to you. Uh, the answer is sort of. We were here to watch the iconic ball drop amongst the million of revelers, the confetti. And let me tell you, it was something to behold. The second you hear Sinatra start singing, it really just takes you into this whole different uh, feeling of, of bringing in the New Year. And so, uh, first and foremost, security went off without a hitch. The NYPD committed to making sure people were safe. They deployed all sorts of technology, including drones and Luckily, everyone was able to stay safe and enjoy the new year. But of course, it wasn't the only place in the world that celebrated the new year. We saw some great and iconic images of celebrations of bringing in the new year from around the world. Uh, in Australia, we saw large crowds gathering at the iconic Harbor Bridge and Opera House for an epic show. The city deploying more police than ever in Hong Kong there. The Victoria Bridge uh, lit up in a display. Uh, Paris itself also bringing in the new year in style. As you know, they're hosting the Summer Olympics. They did a great tribute there. 800,000 people packing the Champs-Élysées for this wonderful celebration of 2024. And here in New York, as I mentioned, uh, security was paramount. The authorities here vowing to stay until every piece of confetti was picked up, Stephen. Yeah, I wanted to ask about that, George. I'm always shocked by just how quickly they're able to get that confetti up. When you're uh, watching it there on the ground or even just watching it on TV, it's so much. I think it's 3,000 pounds of confetti. How's it looking right now? Did they get it cleaned up? 
Yeah, so you, at this hour, you're still seeing sweeping trucks around here, but let me tell you, getting here first thing in the morning, it was kind of amazing to see how much the streets were cleaned up. That's because the NYPD sanitation uh, department or NY, NYC sanitation department was out here basically from midnight through now, uh, about 180 workers with all sorts of gear and equipment to clean up all of that confetti. And again, remarkable how quickly they get it done here. And they really wanted to make sure Times Square was ready to also ring in 2024, Stephen. Yep, incredible stuff, all the work that goes into that. Glad it went off without a hitch. George Solis, thanks so much. Well, starting today, millions of Americans are set to get pay raises as the minimum wage will start to go up in half of all U.S. states. But for business owners, it means higher labor costs, with some already planning to lay off workers because of this. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has more. Where are after years of fighting for a higher wage floor in cities across the country, the new year is going to bring a new paycheck for millions of Americans, with about half of all states and the District of Columbia either raising the minimum wage on January 1st or at some point during the year. Hawaii's increase will be the largest, while Washington will have the highest minimum wage of any state at more than $16 an hour. But it's California and fast food workers like Anisha Williams who are seeing the most seismic changes after years of struggles. I have to pick and choose um, between rent, groceries, um, and livelihood. Now, the Golden State's minimum wage jumps to $16 at the beginning of the year, and for fast food workers, it rises to 20 in April. The mother of six, Williams, says that is definite progress. We protested every which way to prove our point. But businesses are reacting, especially in California, where several Pizza Hut franchise owners will reportedly lay off more than a thousand drivers statewide and rely instead on companies like DoorDash. For mom and pop shops like Frankie's Pizza in Old Town Sacramento, the owner tells us the wage hike will mean longer hours for him. Are you saying you would hire more employees, but because of the rate hike, that is no longer an option? I cannot do it. I can't. Um, I mean, who's going to pay it? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be able to afford to do it. I have to uh, work longer hours to compensate for that. This new reality for many businesses, coming as 20 states still rely on the decades-old federal minimum wage of $7.25, in place since 2009, while workers like Williams see new opportunities. So many people doubting us, and sometimes I can't even believe it, you know, and I'm just so, I'm so happy. Sam Brock, NBC News. We'll be welcomed by so many. Well, coming up, we're taking a look back this morning at the legal headlines that gripped America in 2023. Plus, a look ahead to how new laws that are now going into effect could impact the country in 2024. That's next on Morning News Now. We're back now with a closer look at the major court cases that captured the nation's attention in 2023. Dateline's Keith Morrison breaks down those headlines, including the riveting high-profile murder case involving South Carolina lawyer Alec Murdoch. Disturbing new details coming to light in the Alec Murdoch murder Late developments trial. in the killing of four University of Idaho students. Rex Hewerman tonight accused of being the Gilgo Beach killer. Every year across this great land, there are crimes that draw our attention, stories from which we simply cannot look away. And this year was no exception. In January, all eyes turned to a South Carolina courtroom for one of the biggest trials in decades. Once powerful attorney Alec Murdoch stood accused of killing his wife and son. You're going to reach the inescapable conclusion that Alec murdered Maggie and Paul, that he was the storm. He didn't do it. The case hinged on one key piece of evidence, a cell phone video that proved Alec lied about where he was when the murders took place. Come here, Mama. Come here, Mama. Come here, Mama. Catch. Alec himself took the stand for two days of riveting testimony and admitted he hadn't told the truth about that night. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. But he said he was not a killer. Are you a family annihilator? A family annihilator? You mean like, did I shoot my wife and my son? Yes. No. Do you think putting him on the stand hurt their case? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it helped it. It took just three hours for the jury to convict him. 
I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life. This year also brought us face to face with the man who police say committed acts of unspeakable horror in Idaho. Brian Koberger has been charged with stabbing to death four college students in the middle of the night. The maximum penalty for this offense is death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Victim Katie Gonzalez's heartbroken parents were there in court to watch him. If he is indeed the person, I feel that no mercy should be given to him. Police say DNA ties Koberger to the murders. Hello, I am Officer Loingus. As does a car Koberger was seen driving here that was also captured on security video near the crime scene. All rise. The judge has entered a not guilty plea on Koberger's behalf. The victim's families and friends now wait for a jury to decide his fate. It just hurts. They should still be here, you know. We wake up knowing that we have reached justice for Natalie. 2023 also saw the end of a near 20 year mystery. The disappearance of Alabama teen Natalie Holloway in Aruba, a source of so much pain for her mother Beth, who spoke to Dateline in 2008. Not knowing is the, that's the daily torture. Joran van der Sloot, long suspected of killing Natalie, was extradited to the U.S. this year, charged with trying to extort Natalie's family. And as part of a plea deal, he agreed to confess. I'm actually with, uh, with Natalie walking along the beach. Van der Sloot said that when Natalie rejected his sexual advances, he hit her in the head with a cinder block. And then... I walk up, uh, up to about my knees into the ocean and I push her off into the sea. It's been a very long and painful journey but we finally got the answers we've been searching for for all these years. Rex, did you do it? Another years-long saga took a stunning turn this summer when police announced they discovered the identity of the Long Island serial killer. Rex Ureland, I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. Police arrested 59-year-old father of two, Rex Ureman, outside his Manhattan office. Few who knew him could believe it. Completely bone chilling. If this is true, yeah, he's lied to us. I mean, he was just a normal guy. In July, Jurman was charged with murdering three women along Gilgo Beach. And police said he was strongly suspected of killing a fourth. He pleaded not guilty. A trial is still a long way off. Are you confident that Rex Jurman will spend the rest of his life behind bars? If you ask me, I'm, I'm sure that he'll never see the light of day again. Keith Morrison, Dateline NBC. No one's got a voice like Keith Morrison. Thanks for that. Meanwhile, with the new year comes new laws for several states across the country, from protecting election workers to gender-neutral toys. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian is taking a closer look at some of the major changes for the new year. Hey, good morning. From the meaningful to the mundane, new laws are taking effect in every state. Here are some of the measures drawing attention as 2024 gets underway. After threats drove away half the state's top election officials, Nevada took action. Starting January 1st, those who harass, intimidate, or harm election workers performing their duties in the state could face up to four years in prison under a new law that unanimously passed the state legislature. Most people don't realize either that 80% of our election workers are women. Those are our daughters, those are our wives, those are our sisters, those are our mothers. A campaign promised by Secretary of State Francisco Aguilar, the law makes Nevada one of a handful of states where threats to election workers are a felony. We cannot run elections without people. They are our unsung heroes of democracy. In Tennessee, a new law toughens penalties for distracted driving. Those under 18 cited for a second offense could see their license suspended. The measure is named for a local businessman who died in a 2020 accident. If it's just one life we save a year by this law, then my dad would have been an honor to have it in his name. California is requiring stores with more than 500 employees in the state to offer gender-neutral toy sections. Failure to comply could result in fines. Why would it be such that a dinosaur or a truck or a periodic table would be in the boys section or glitter or paint would be in the girls section? Let's just fundamentally allow kids to be kids. You've seen all the criticism of this. Uh, one, one newspaper called it California's latest woke insanity. How do you respond to that? 
This bill was inspired by private sector, uh, following that of re major retailers, Target, and so many others are already going in this direction. This is a manufactured uh, controversy in saying that it is a, a potentially a, a woke government. In Louisiana, the state legislature overrode the governor's veto of a bill banning gender-affirming care for transgendered minors. The bill prohibits doctors from prescribing puberty blockers and hormone treatments. Critics say the new law won't survive a court challenge. It is my sincere belief that this bill is unconstitutional. I believe the courts will declare that in due course. Pennsylvania toughened penalties for drivers who failed to stop for flashing red lights on school buses. And Michigan is allowing 16-year-olds to pre-register to vote. Our thanks to Ken Delanian for that report. The Brennan Center think tank says at least 14 states have passed measures as well, making it harder to vote, while 23 states have enacted laws to make it easier. People in swing states like Michigan and Nevada will now have more ways than ever to vote. Well, what better way to bring in the new year than with a resolution or two that might just start your 2024 off on the right foot? After the break, we've got some tips on how you can stay motivated when that holiday shine starts to wear off. We'll be right back. Welcome back. It's the new year, which means it's time for so many people to set those annual resolutions, whether that's hitting the gym more, getting finances in order, or traveling more. We have the tips to make sure you can stay on track for 2024. Let's bring in Kristen Glosserman for more on this. She's an executive life coach and also the author of If It's Not Right, Go Left. So Kristen, good morning to you. Happy New Year. Let's start off with mindset. I know you say that uh, that's important and it's more than just having a positive attitude. How's that? Good morning. Happy New Year to you and all your viewers. Um, yes, let's begin with mindset this new year. It is way more important than just a positive attitude. Mindset really is the energy behind every decision you'll make. It's the it's the director of your narrative and the lens in which you see everything. It's really the difference between success and failure. Discipline, of course, is also very important for resolutions. We know that much. But how important is goal setting? What does successful goal setting look like? So, um... Most people want to have a goal in the new year. And when I work with clients, I encourage them to have three things around their goal. So I'd like you to think about this. I'd like your goals to be inspiring. It should be something that really excites you, that gets you out of bed. Your goals should be attainable. So saying you want to become a billionaire this year, mm -hmm. that might not be the direction you want to move in. Say you want to increase sales by 50% or you want to make, you know, 25% more than last year. So make sure that they're attainable. That will keep you motivated. And then lastly, it's okay that your goals are flexible. Three months in, you might want to modify that goal and that's okay. Yeah, that's a, a great point as well. I'm also curious, how can you help a, a loved one, a spouse who has resolutions, how can you help them stick to their goals without sort of becoming uh, like a nag for them? I don't want to nag my husband about his new goals of uh, trying to eat better. How can we support them? Well, you, what you want to do is you want to partner with someone that you care about, right? And one of the things that I recommend as a coach is asking permission, like, hey, you're talking to me about this. Like, give me permission to work on this with you. And one of the best things you can do for someone who's asking for that type of support is to hold them accountable. Accountability is a really important piece in achieving goals. So if someone's talking to you about something that's important to them, you might wanna offer accountability. That could be really helpful. That is great advice. Uh, uh, what if we uh, are trying to hold ourselves accountable? How can we do that uh, in a way that lets us uh, still be kind to ourselves? Um, that's a great question. I have found the best way to hold myself accountable is to write things down. So when you write things down, you build accountability with yourself. That's uh, some great advice. Kristen Glosserman, giving people the tools they need as they enter 2024. Thanks so much for your time this morning. It's been a pleasure. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.
Well, coming up, it was a banner year for space exploration across the globe. After the break, we'll head to the stars with a look at some of the headline grabbing moments from 2023 that got us excited for what's to come in 2024. That's coming up next. Stick around. Welcome back. 2024 is set to be one giant leap for mankind. That's because for the first time since the days of Apollo, humans are again to set to fly over the moon this year. Now, this comes after a historic year for space exploration, which, unlike the days of Apollo, largely came from private industry. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has more. Yeah, that's right. Elon Musk, of course, owns SpaceX, and SpaceX right now provides the only way American astronauts can right now get to space on an American rocket. And America's future hopes and dreams for space depend on SpaceX. That rocket roar and cheering coming from South Texas in November Stage separation. Boost was for a much improved second test of Elon Musk's Starship after the first Starship exploded shortly after liftoff. This time, all 33 engines fired in perfect unison. While the booster was lost in a spectacular explosion three minutes after launch. And as you can see, the super heavy booster has just experienced a rapid unscheduled disassembly. The uncrewed second stage climbed 92 miles high, well into space, before self-destructing. We got so much data, and that will all help us to improve for our next flight. NASA and America have strapped their dreams to that SpaceX rocket. That next flight will be early next year. Then late in the year, NASA's Artemis astronauts will loop around the moon. In 2022, an Artemis test flight orbited the moon with no crew. That is the spaceship that will take the Artemis II crew to an orbit around the moon for the first time in more than 50 years. This is a nine-day mission, a quarter of a million miles just to get there, and this ship is nothing like Apollo to carry Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. It is much more advanced, much more automated. Already, they're training at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Mission Commander Reed Weissman, Pilot Victor Glover, Mission Specialist Christina Cook, and Canadian fighter pilot Jeremy Hansen. I'm most looking forward to paving the way for the future, back to the moon, onto Mars. The fact that we get to contribute to that, absolutely an honor, the honor of my life. And we are proud to be a part of the Artemis generation. We are the Artemis generation, and we are going back to the moon. Later this decade, NASA hopes Artemis and Elon Musk's Starship will rendezvous in lunar orbit, then land on the moon's south pole and begin building a lunar base. China wants to land its own astronauts there by 2030. But NASA chief Bill Nelson says America's return to the moon will not be an Apollo repeat. We're going back to the moon. It's actually a different moon. We're going to the south pole. The South Pole, which may hold frozen ice water, critical for a future moon base and a potential source of rocket fuel for missions onto Mars. It's why India landed a probe there in 2023, and it's the same region that China is targeting for a human landing. The new space race seems likely to pick up speed in 2024. Tom, I think the space race is really between us and China. And we need to protect the interest of the international community. Also in 2024, Boeing is hoping to finally launch its Starliner spaceship with astronauts to the space station. Many years delayed and well behind arch rival SpaceX. And billionaire entrepreneur Jared Isaacman will command Polaris Dawn, another private mission with three others in a SpaceX rocket set to reach the highest Earth orbit ever flown. I caught up with them training in Colorado. Why, why do this? Why do we need to go into space? I mean, there are questions that we've been asking ourselves since like the, the dawn of civilization, right? That we don't know the answers to and the universe is so big. That Polaris Dawn mission will also feature the first ever spacewalk involving a private astronaut. And they will continue raising money for St. Jude Children's Hospital. The first mission back in 2021 raised a quarter of a billion dollars for St. Jude. Back to you.
Wow, fascinating stuff. Tom Costello, thank you. And we end this hour with one man's mission of returning lost memories to loved ones, which all starts with a picture. NBC News correspondent Valerie Castro shows us the project to get these nostalgic images back to their rightful owners. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. Summertime in a swimming pool, having like a family dinner, taking a picture in front of somebody's house. Like these are all just really special moments that people had. But what is it worth to someone who has no idea who is in the photo? All these photos have a story behind them and every single uh, picture is a, a picture of a real person who lived a real life. What started as a pandemic project developed into a mission for David Guttenmacher, creating the Museum of Lost Memories. So the bride's name is Lulu, the groom's name is Frankie, and they were married on June 5th, 1965. Some old footage of someone opening a Christmas gift in 1974. It's an online collection of photos, slides, and reels of film David hopes to return to their rightful owners, or at least to those who recognize the people in the pictures. I've been able to return thousands of things to dozens and dozens of families. What's the reaction you get when you connect someone with their lost memories? Yeah, I think there sometimes there's a little bit of skepticism that people don't understand how this got out there or how it got back to them, but everyone's been shocked and grateful in a good way. He finds the images at various thrift stores and flea markets. The albums and boxes of film often sold off in estate sales. I've also heard plenty of stories of people just misplacing something or donating it by accident. A lot of cameras I'll find with film still inside or SD cards still inside the camera. With the magic of social media and more than 600,000 followers, David has a built-in team of photo sleuths examining every detail. Everyone has their own set of skills. Some people are really good at dating specific artifacts, and some people just are able to recognize a location from a photo because they grew up there. One success story uncovered World War II history when he found this old roll of film with a note and the name Friedman inside the canister. So the note said these were taken in April 1943 and it was written in German so I knew that the family was in Germany in April 1943 and then finally somebody was able to recognize the family on one of these ancestry websites and matched up the exact family with the photos that I found. And we found out that they escaped from Vienna and they fled in the early 1940s and these were taken shortly after that. Um, so it was so special to be able to return these core family memories back to the original owners. This set of pictures was not dated, but the hairstyles and fashion clearly said 1990s. It was from Chapman University. I was 18 years old. Diane Prunier says a friend recognized her among these photos, and she recognized her old classmates. In the first photo, I was like, oh, that's my friend Dan from Chapman University. I kept scrolling through, and I was like, that's my friend Lou. I was like, that's Michelle. And then I was the last photo. So the professor had maybe taken these photos of us. So I don't know how they ended up from her ownership to like a flea market in San Diego, but somehow he found them and posted them. And I think it's wonderful. Melissa Donofrio also had that magic moment of recognition. This photo right here um, of my uncle Mike is when I went, oh my gosh, like that, that's my family. Like that is my uncle Mike. What's going on? In her case, an entire photo album mistakenly donated to a church when a family member passed away, brought back memories of loved ones. And in this photo is my grandma. And I knew it was my grandma in a heartbeat. I have one photo of a great grandparent of mine, and that's the only photo that I have of him. So to be able to like give back a family photo that might be one of the only few memories of that person is really special. This reel of vacation footage from New York City in 1965 captured the buzz on the city streets, a window to a different view of everyday life. And people were commenting, I remember that store, I used to eat at that restaurant, oh like just things that this wow. family that was here on vacation filmed. Photographs also capture life's most precious moments, like this one day old baby or the somber passing of a loved one. Vacation photos sometimes documenting a landmark that no longer stands today. David's latest endeavor, tracking down the owners of these memories. I'm grateful that like, I'm given this chance that I can cherish them myself, but also hopefully give them back to someone who can cherish them too. A holiday gift just waiting to be seen. Valerie Castro, NBC News. Quite the project.
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.